Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Spark 2023. Uh, and thank you to our choir, if you are lucky enough to catch them on your way into the auditorium, Sing It Loud, who are an award-winning community choir that anyone can join to discover the joy of singing. And we thought that would be a great way to kick off the day, because we all need a bit of joy first thing in the morning. So um, if this is your first Spark, thank you for coming. Uh, you will be um, joining between 300 and 350 delegates throughout the day to come to Spark every year. It's an annual event. And it is the fourth one we've done, the fourth year running. Um, and welcome to the Royal Spa Centre. My name is David, David Gilding, and I run the arts team that operates the Royal Spa Centre, the Royal Pump Rooms and Leamington Town Hall. And we also have uh, a grants giving function uh, and a strategic um, function. So roughly 600,000 people come through our venues every year. And we employ roughly 55 people and hundreds of freelancers and casuals every year. Throughout the day, hopefully you'll meet uh, members of our team. Many of you all know Jonathan Branson, who leads on Spark. Um, Bronwyn Allsop will also be helping out in the workshops downstairs, if you're part of that. And many, many of my our team are around to help you throughout the day. So, Spark, if you haven't been before, it began back in 2019, and we were carrying out some consultation with the creative sector in Warwick District, and uh, with an aim to create a growth strategy for the sector for the next five years. And as we were going through that consultation and talking to many of the people in this room, over 400 arts and uh, creative organisations, the same issues kept coming up again and again, which were mainly around lack of profile, lack of support, lack of platform, and lack of joined up thinking and, and connectivity in the sector. So as we were working through towards that strategy, we became pretty clear pretty quickly that we needed to have an event in our calendar where our um, creative community can come together every year to celebrate what we do. Um, because what also came out of that consultation was how deep and rich and wide the breadth of our creative industry is here in Warwick District. So the tagline for Spark is connect, celebrate and collaborate. And they're the three aims of what we try and do with this event every year. And the day's content is structured very loosely around those strategic themes of our um, strategy which is voice, which is about the promotion and profile of the sector, placemaking, about how our public spaces and private spaces can re reflect our creativity, pathfinding around jobs, skills, and networking, engagement about arts and cultural projects that engage people, engage audiences, and change lives, and innovation around technology and cutting edge um, solutions and um, different ways of thinking. So throughout the day in this room here, you've got a series of lectures with some incredible people giving you their thoughts and um, some great information. The first session following this will be on placemaking. So we've got Purcell Architects talking about um, turning Leamington Town Hall into a creative hub. This building work should begin in that this year. We've got the Royal Shakespeare Company talking about their public programs. And we've got Alan from LTB in Coventry talking about the incredible work he's done there to create a meanwhile space and this um, essentially second home for artists just through pure determination. And then later following that, we've got Global Leamington with um, some of those amazing, just a few of those amazing organisations that work globally from Leamington and Warwick and Kenilworth. So uh, talking about the Commonwealth Games, we're talking uh, about the development of the United Reformed Church um, and the um, old Dole Office, if you know where that is, in Spencer Yard, uh, to be the new home for Cogent and SAE. And we'll also have the game, uh, Kind Games talking about their global reach as well. Followed on by uh, a session which is really, really good, which is about uh, creativity against all odds, which includes a local filmmaker and author, uh, Pangea Sculpture Center, and art that makes you think. All very different uh, disciplines, but all brilliantly successful. And then at the very end of the day, which we hope you stick around for, is emerging creatives, those uh, creatives at the start of their career. Uh, and we've got um, some illustrators, we've got some dancers, and we've got um, composers as well. So meanwhile, while all this is happening, this year what we wanted to do was give you some takeaways um, and some skills as well. So there's some workshops running alongside that downstairs in our backstage basement. Uh, on fundraising, IP, volunteers, and social media. If you haven't signed up for those, they are fully booked, um, but it is worth checking in with uh, Jonathan if you catch him throughout the day, because he may well have some cancellations, but otherwise we are fully booked for those. Uh, throughout the foyers, we've got 16 creative organizations um, giving information on what they do. Please visit them during the breaks. 
and some brilliant demonstrations as well with um, Brink doing some street art at the front. We've got uh, River scanning objects and using VR upstairs in the upper foyer. We've got some motion capture downstairs and we've even got some robots out the front as well. So everything but the kitchen sink there. It's quite a challenging time for the sector, um, talking about this building and the performing arts. Touring is, is tricky right now with the cost of um, energy and all the other factors that, and uh, um, recruitment and all that kind of thing. Uh, and all of us are feeling a bit of a pinch there in, in terms of our business and our creative enterprises. But there are some really, really incredible things happening in this district that you need to be aware of that hopefully you will um, see throughout the day. So there's lots of reasons to be positive and optimistic if you live and work in this region. The first one being that um, the creative quarter in Southtown, work has begun at long last on that project. A United Reformed Church is being developed in the old Dole office. The Stonely Arms project will be closely following making a maker's hub at some point soon. And as I mentioned already, the um, town hall in Leamington is funded by the Future High Streets Fund to regenerate high streets will soon be on its first phase to becoming a creative hub, a very prominent thing on the high street to um, support the creative sector. And apart from all those bricks and mortar um, places, we've also got some funding um, through the, count the district council for um, the UK Share Prosperity Fund. So there's just under £400,000 coming into this district over the next two years to support projects to happen in these spaces as well. So, um, just to give you a few examples, that we are looking at developing the Lights of Leamington Festival that once started um, back in the 50s, I think it was, in um, Jetson Gardens. There will be some money, more money for skills and training and development, apprentices, that kind of thing. Um, there is some money there to develop new ways of promoting what we do so everybody can uh, reach our audiences. There's potentially a new public art scheme and festival on the cards. Uh, and we've got some development money to develop an organisation to move them into that stonely arms at the end of the day that make us help to try and get um, a really great thing happening there. And lastly, the last project on the list is something that we're going to be asking you to get involved in right today, which is at the end of today's uh, session, you will get an email questionnaire, as we always do. Rather than ignoring it and putting it in the bin, um, please do respond to it, because we also have a significant amount of money to grow Spark for the next two years as well. So if you are sat there thinking, hmm, I wish they had done this, or I'd like you to do this differently, now is the time at the end of the day to give us that feedback, because we will be able to spend that money wisely with your um, opinions. So do take some time to reflect on that and give us your thoughts at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, it is your event. So before we kick off with our first session, some very basic housekeeping things. Um, there won't be a fire alarm test today, because that would be insane, as we're in the middle of a conference. Um, it, we haven't had any um, requests for any ex accessibility needs, but if you do have any things that will make your um, visit more enjoyable, please contact a member of our team. We will do our best to help you. If you need any help of any kind throughout the day, uh, there's an information point right in the corner by the main entrance, or just grab a member of the uh, team in a Spark t-shirt, and we will do our best to help you. And if you haven't already, do collect your name badge and your delegate pack from upstairs in the tables upstairs there. That's got the map, the schedule, the biographies. Um, it's also, most importantly, got your food voucher in for lunch. And uh, we've also chucked in a loyalty card for the cinema here if you fancy to come visit us again and watch a film. Um, if you prefer to do your stuff digitally, all of that stuff is online. There's QR cards, QR codes everywhere. Just scan them and it will take you to the relevant page on our website. Free tea and coffee refreshments will be served throughout the day upstairs. We've got the lunch served between 12 and 2 to avoid those queues we had last time. Make the advantage of that whenever you can, the earlier the better. And pitch up and eat anywhere you can find a spare table. Uh, and that includes the auditorium. During lunchtime, we'll be showing some locally made films on the screen for you to enjoy whilst eating your lunch. We hope you'll join us at the end of the day for our closing comments to uh, reflect on what we've learned. But after that, from about 4.30 till 6, we've also got a uh, post-Spark social event at One Mill Street. If you've not been before, it's a great time to come along and have a look at it. Uh, we've got live music by Levi Washington and CJ Wood. If you're a tweeter, please do hashtag, feel free to publish things to social media throughout the day using the hashtag WDSpark2023. Uh, and there is a LinkedIn group if you're on LinkedIn and wish to connect with anyone here today. Spark 2023, just do a search and you can connect digitally with people as well. Uh, and very lastly, um, we are filming these sessions today and there'll also be, it's also an official photographer walking around taking shots. If you don't wish your image to um, be published, please just have a word with a photographer directly, the lovely Joe, who's 
um, taking photographs throughout the day, and she will make sure your name's added to the list and you won't be published. Um, so that's all from me. We'll crack on with the first session, uh, which is placemaking, building creative communities, shared by Nicola Richardson. Richardson? Yeah. Uh, Co-founder of Vortex Creates, a company which does actually transform spaces. So a great chair for this session and some really, really cool and interesting things to say. So over to you guys. To this session on placemaking, building creative communities. Um, I'm very passionate about placemaking, um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, placemaking is a planned and intentional process. It's not just about placemaking. Um, it's about designing and managing spaces. It's about ensuring that users of spaces are not just considered, but involved. It's about a range of stakeholders, a range of people, and I think you'll agree that our panel today offer a real mix of people that are involved in, in true placemaking. It's about making the most of a local community, and it's about making the most of the assets that it has and nourishing the potential. Um, through great placemaking, we can create quality spaces that people are happy and healthy in, um, that strengthen connections in community. Um, and not only between the community themselves, but with the places that they inhabit. I know, um, yeah, you've all looked at this and uh, see, seen our panel, so um, without further ado, um, I will uh, just introduce myself a little bit, and um, then in each panel member will give a short presentation, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, so, yes. My name's Nicola, uh, and I graduated as a fine artist um, back in 2000. Um, and my work has and always um, will be about installation. It will always be about the spaces and what we put in those spaces to provoke question and debate. Um, during my career, I've done a lot of work within educational settings to look at how environmental changes and considered design not only promotes good teaching and learning but also um, looks after the well-being of staff and students within those spaces and most importantly communicates to them and the wider public and people invited into those spaces the values and ethos of those those settings. Um, in 2008, I uh, co-founded Vortex Creates, um, some pictures on the, on the board behind me, um, with my beautifully talented uh, business partner, Marianne Tavener. Um, and we transform spaces um, with a lot of different artistic interventions. Our work is about considered design that creates shared experiences. It's often about making people see places through fresh eyes, um, and it's always about connecting people, and it's always about joy. Um, the slide behind me um, is a series of works that we were commissioned to produce as part of the opening moment for City of Culture. Um, it was about creating interventions across the city that told a story. It was about championing the hero that was part of uh, each intervention. So each of these are a, a kind of Coventry celebrity. Um, but it was also about communicating a sense of place and about Coventry's history and what makes it brilliant. Uh, the story is told through a group of young people that kind of ran through the space and came across these, these interventions. And it was about them rediscovering their city. Um, for us, as Vortex, placemaking is always about the stories that we tell, um, about the stories of the past, the stories of the present, but about creating spaces for other people to create their own stories. So, without further ado, I would love to invite uh, the wonderful Ida Ballerina, um, who is the curator, creative placemaking and public programmes at the RSC. Thank you. Sorry, where do we need? Over there. Morning all, great to be here with you all today. Am I really loud? Yeah? Yeah? Good. Next slide, please. So, 
it's great to be here with you all today. My name is Ida Ballerini. I am the Creative Placemaking and Public Programs Curator at the Royal Shakespeare Company. And through my presentation, I'm gonna give you a bit of an idea of the work that we do, our program, and the way in which we build creative communities in Stratford. Next slide, please. Um, I often start my presentations with this lovely aerial image of the RSC and our theatres. Isn't it beautiful? It's just absolutely wonderful, picture perfect. Um, the buildings are amazing and they really say culture, theatre. But this image also says something else and that's the reason why I, I have chose to have it here. It literally presents the monolithic weight of our organisation in Stratford-upon-Avon where we're based. As you probably know, the RSC, it's a, a large global organization based in a small market town. And so that opened up some questions around our responsibility in influencing the identity of the place and obviously the relationship with our communities there. So I think that is a very emblematic image. Um, next slide, please. So probably all of you uh, have a sense of what the RSC does. We are a world-class theater made in Stratford-upon-Avon and shared around the world. So yeah, we are a, a national portfolio organization. This is our core business. Everybody knows for this and, um, and we're very proud of. But there's also a lot else that we do. And today I wanna talk about my department, which is a much smaller department and it's called Creative Placemaking and Public Programs. Next slide, please. So. Creative placemaking. We are a brand new department. We started two and a half years ago. And so we developed during COVID, but not in response to COVID. Um, these are three pillars of our work, which really sets the scene for what we are about. We are about people and our communities, especially the communities in Stratford-upon-Avon at our doorstep. We are about place, sense of place, and be rooted in Stratford-upon-Avon. And of course, we are all about culture. Through creative activities, we create a large program of events, exhibitions, workshops that offer ways into culture and creativity to audiences. Next slide, please. But yes, we've been through a transformation. We haven't always been creative placemaking. In fact, my department was formerly known as events and exhibitions, which gives you a very good sense of the work we used to do. We program events, we program exhibitions, workshops, but that doesn't necessarily cut the mustard in the sense of giving you idea, an idea of the purpose of the work that we were doing. We were creating beautiful work for people and it was genuinely beautiful. Most of the time it was free. We welcomed people to our gallery spaces. We welcomed them to our workshops, into our gardens. But we were still not reaching some of the communities at our doorstep. The threshold of that beautiful building that you have just seen, that monolithic imposing building, was really a barrier in reaching those audiences. And sometimes we felt we didn't have connections with those audiences. There wasn't a dialogue. We were seeing only some of our communities communities. And so through our transformation, we developed and we merged into creative placemaking and public programs. And as you see, we the word there is slightly different. It says we're creating beautiful work with people. So just one word different, but major difference. So all our work, everything we do right now is co-created. So through socially engaged practice, all our work across all our program is created with communities, with other organizations, and whoever it's on, it's with us on that journey. Next slide, please. So when we were building our strategy, these are some of the key pillars of what our department is about. Our purpose is that we believe that everybody's life is enriched by culture and creativity, which I hope a lot of you will relate to here today. Our vision is to create Stratford-upon-Avon as an exceptional place to live, work, visit and invest. Our mission is to shape inspirational change with people and our values are to inspire, animate and be a catalyst for change. Next slide, please. How do we do that? We really focus on wanting to create deep relationship with our local communities, and that can only happen through ongoing engagement. Engagement that is there week after week, month after month, year after year. We also invest in bold placemaking projects, which improve the well-being of the participants that co-create with us, as well as of the audiences and the people in the town that stumbles across it. 
and we co-produce work which wants to have and has to have a contemporary relevance and resonance for diverse audiences. This is really important for our survival as a world-class cultural organization. And of course, the other paramount thing is that we really want to be open and share our learnings because it's only through that sharing of those learnings that we're going to transform our communities, our neighborhood, and democratize the platforms that we have available to communicate. Next slide, please. So our program has three strands, and later on I'll give you some tangible examples of some of the projects that we've been recently doing. We have community, placemaking, and change. The community projects obviously are the ones focusing on community and ongoing engagement. So maybe with specific stakeholders in our town, that may be recurrent such as town trails, uh, festival trails, things like that, for which we work with specific partners on a recurrent basis. Placemaking are those bold projects I was mentioning before. These are the projects that you wouldn't be missing if you were to come to Stratford. They're gonna be right there in your face, uh, asking you to engage in the dialogue and explore ideas of identity of the place. And then change, another very important strand. Of course, uh, our public program as Creative Placemaking uh, involves also podcasts or all our on-stage talks, our director's talks, etc. So the one that really connected to the work that you see on stage at the RSC. And what we do, we bring in communities to influence those processes and once again democratize those platforms. So who's chairing those discussions? Who are the communities that may be involved in shaping some of the questions that we're going to be asking directors? Next slide, please. So, of course, when we started two and a half years ago, the first question was, what does even creative placemaking mean? And uh, how are we going to formulate uh, the initial uh, stepping stone that's going to dictate what we truly are about? And obviously, wanting to be embedded in Stratford upon Avon, the people that had the answer were going to be our communities. So we ran a large consultation with our communities, and we asked that exact question. And this is the definition that we came up together. Creativity, sorry, creative placemaking at the RSC is using creativity and culture with people to enliven public spaces for social and economic change. So from that moment on, we really have been standing by that, making sure that we are truly representing our communities. Next slide, please. So yes, it's all about people, people, people. You may have gathered that from the things that I have already said. There are a few things that we talked about, that we talk about in my department, which are, um, for example, co-led innovation. So we are a brand new department. We talk about co-led innovation and emerging strategy. Those two things are very important. We want to be really open. We know we don't have all the answers and we want to be flexible, agile. We want to be able to change processes if they're not working. We're setting some tracks, but we allow for interference and we want interference with the outside world and for people to tell us, that didn't work, how about we do this, or I had an idea. So a lot of our work is about leaving space for participants, communities, other stakeholders to influence us and make us better, essentially. Next slide, please. So let's talk about some of our recent projects, which hopefully give you an idea of what we've been doing in the past two and a half years. The work of our department really comes in all shape and sizes. We span from large-scale exhibitions with uh, lots of partners to small grassroots intimate projects. But the constant across our work, if it wasn't clear enough, it's all about socially engaged practice and co-creation. So we do it with people, we don't do it on our own. Whatever we create, it's always co-created. And then the other aspect of our work is that, of course, we are truly embedded into Stratford. We are at the beginning of our department. We really need to understand the context in which we are operating. But of course, the ramifications of our work go much further in the region and obviously even beyond through our national connections, our industry connections with events such as today, where we can really share learnings and hear other people speaking, and for all of you guys to obviously influence the work that we do in Stratford today. Next slide, please. So here I have a few uh, photographs of some of the projects we've been doing. This is Everything to Everybody, your Shakespeare, your culture. This is an exhibition that took place at the Library of Birmingham. It was part of the cultural uh, program of the Commonwealth Games last summer. 
Um, over 8,000 people came to see this exhibition and it was in partnership with the Library of Birmingham, well, Birmingham City Council and the University of Birmingham. The premise of this exhibition that was part of a much larger four-year engagement project with over 30 community partners across the city was to bring to light the incredible yet unknown heritage, I suppose it wasn't unknown, it was forgotten, heritage of the Birmingham Shakespeare Memorial Library, a beautiful collection um, that is held at the Library of Birmingham. So through those four years engagement in the project, they connected with 30 community partners and really did a lot of discovery of this collection. And our role was to curate the exhibition. Obviously, um, this is a major asset for the city of Birmingham. And last year, all eyes were on the city of Birmingham. We really wanted to celebrate this incredible forgotten heritage and actually say that it's part of the identity of the city. It was an incredible, compelling story. It literally said, how can culture help us create better cities for our future. We are all responsible for the present of our cities as well as for building the possible futures of our city. So very much looking at heritage and culture and Shakespeare as a way to ask those questions with communities. So communities help us, uh, helped us choosing the objects that featured in the exhibition. They also helped us with the marketing campaigns. Some of them, you can see them there uh, holding the placard they were literally our poster faces. They used their social media to once again infiltrate even more into their communities, way more than we would have been able to do uh, with the exhibition and bringing those messages into their communities. And then people were trained as heritage ambassadors, so they had a chance to discover the collection and if they were interested, be part of the team that would manage the exhibition, would help visitors, etc. Massive aspect of this project, the engagement project that the university and the council are doing ends this year. So we are currently having legacy plans. How do we keep the flame alive? How do we ensure that these communities that have just found out about this incredible asset, and if you haven't uh, heard about it, please have a look. How do we ensure that those communities continue to feel connected? Digitalization, catalogation projects, this is a collection that belongs to you and it's really part of your city. Um, so yeah, this was one of our largest projects. Uh, over 8,000 people came to see it over uh, 12 weeks. Next slide, please. At the opposite end of the spectrum, in terms of scale, but certainly not of value, we have Like I Care. This is a project that we did with Warwickshire Young Carer, who are uh, an organization that works with young people that have a uh, caring responsibility in their everyday to day life. It was a beautiful project inspired by the caring role of Satsuki to her little sister May in our production of My Neighbor Totoro that was at the Barbican in London until a few weeks ago. We worked with nine people spanning from the age of seven to 14, and we worked with regional artists Curly McGee and Pickle Illustration, who are actually here today and will be doing a presentation later on. And basically, through a series of workshops, we transformed the everyday life's experiences of these young people into beautiful artworks. Incredible project that enable us to really bring to audiences some untold narratives that are on our doorstep and say, hey, Hey, have you ever considered this? So beautiful project. Next slide, please. Meeting Point Program, um, a project that is very close to my heart. I'm working on this at the moment. So not everybody knows, but the RSC is way more than a theater. We are also an accredited museum, which means that we are a museum. We have a collection. It spans 400 years of history, and it includes costumes, paintings, uh, theatricalia. It also includes the first folio, Shakespeare's first folio, an important publication without which we wouldn't have so many of Shakespeare's plays. And this year happens to be the 400th anniversary of this incredible book. This year at the RSC, it's also the year in which we are exploring brand new chapters of the ways in which we want to work. And we're considering questions of power and power shift. How do we shift power? Who holds power? How does it affect a human being and wherever they're gonna be doing in their lives? 
For this project, we commissioned an artist and composer called Liz Gray. She's working with nine Syrian women from the local charity Welcome Here, who welcomes refugees in Stratford-upon-Avon. And they've been exploring the first folio, the heritage of this incredible object, considering how was this book made, where has it been, who has touched it and who hasn't, what narratives are inside it, but which are also the narratives that are not in it. And then obviously an exploration of ideas of storytelling, story gathering, what are the stories, the histories, the comedies, the tragedies of all our lives, and how do we transform those into an artistic output. So the women are recording their families and their friends, and we're gonna create a new compositional piece that will be presented in April, uh, working with composer Liz Gray. Absolutely beautiful project, which I hope you'll all come to see in Stratford. Next slide, please. At the Forest Edge, so a bit of a sneaky peek because this project hasn't yet been announced. Uh, it will be announced in March. At the Forest Edge is gonna be our biggest creative placemaking project to date. It's part of that category that we said placemaking, bold, you won't miss it if you come to Stratford. Um, it will take place this spring, it will run throughout the summer. We are working with a visual artist and a theater maker and six local communities that represent the diversity of Stratford-upon-Avon to explore themes of nature, transformation, healing power of nature, family relationships, as well as grief and loss. And the themes are coming directly from the two plays you're gonna be seeing on stage this summer, which are Hamnet, from the book from Maggie O'Farrell, and As You Like It. And through a series of workshops, we'll create some beautiful installations that, as I said, you won't be missing. There'll also be three moments of spectacle in which we'll animate the town. Um, and we are literally about to start. Workshops are next week, so a very exciting time for us. And um, yeah, the, the project will, will be announced very soon. So watch this space and please do come to see us in Stratford. That was my last slide, but I have another one with our contacts. Be great to hear from all of you later. Please do come and find me and ask some questions because it's what today is all about. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ida. Um, brilliant. And next up is uh, the wonderful Alian Denya, from, who is the owner and founder of the LTB buildings in Coventry. Take it away, Alan. Good morning. Um, I feel a bit of an imposter here today because I'm not an artist, I'm not a musician, um, but I tell you, the, the energy that, 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 that places create with culture in the mix. That, that's what draws me into, in, into this conversation. I'm just a guy that likes fixing up buildings, really. That's, that's my background. I, I'm, I'm an ex-telecoms uh, guy who then went into property development, but, um, and I run a restoration business. That's my day job, if you like. So I try and, I try and give my time, uh, spare time, to um, what... I don't even know what LTB is really. I, you know, I suppose we call it a community culture space, uh, but it's 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 meanwhile use of um, of spaces which which aren't being used for anything else. I've done this three or four times now, but really, City of Culture um, in Coventry um, last year was was kind of my inspiration for this. Um, we were looking for a space so that we could have a venue during City of Culture year. And I say when we, when I say we, that's kind of like a group of volunteers that that I've worked with before. But it's also artists, creatives, musicians, people doing interesting things. My motivation uh, with all of this is to make Coventry a more interesting place, and that's kind of where where I come from with everything. Okay, first slide. So um, I don't know how well you know Coventry, but uh, the Lytton Tree is a uh, pub, which is in Coventry Town Centre, and I'd been looking for a space to um, to inhabit, to take over, a meanwhile use space. And um, somebody mentioned to me that there might be some some opportunity in the upper floors of, of this building. So um, I made an introduction, got myself in to have a look, and um, 
if you roll on to the next slide, right, here we go. Um, this, this is what I came across. So this is, we call it um, LTB because that's short for Litton Tree Building. I couldn't think of anything more original than that. Um, huge big space, but uh, needed lots and lots of work doing. Um, basically, the owners said to me, look, if you can fix it up at your own cost and then manage the space, you can have it as a freebie. Um, I like free because it just kind of means that you can get things done really quickly. You don't need to wait around for funding or... But, um, okay, next slide. Um, the spaces themselves, for me, I don't know, it's... I'm a, I'm a fan of architecture, I'm a fan of buildings, and I think it's, I don't know, it's maybe the, the cave the caveman or cave woman in all of us, or, or the Anglo-Saxon, where we used to come together, like we are today, in, in a space, um, to, to share stories, to tell stories, um, to share experiences. And that's why the architecture of a building um, and, and what you can do with those, with those spaces is, is the exciting thing for me. If you, can, if you can use the drama of the building to inspire people, to make them want to come in and do their thing, whether that's theater, comedy, putting art on the wall, um, playing in a band, all those sort of things. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know I, for me, it, it's, it's the architecture, the building that, that draws me. So that's why I was really interested in this space. And it's a, on the previous slide, it said, build it and they will come. Um, you've heard that before, but it's kind of like, what I try and do is set up a space that, that draws people in. Okay, next slide. So um, it's also the history of a building that I think is important because part of my, I don't know, I, I, I still see myself as a, as a punter. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the audience and um, I try and create experiences, create um, an environment that draws not just an arts audience into the fold but also appeals way beyond that to all those people out there who don't think that arts and culture are for them. So for me, history is a really important thread to lay out, um, to sort of say, well, look, you know, come along, explore this building, um, find out something about the history of the building or about the history of Coventry. But at the same time, um, we're putting interesting um, art, uh, films, um, sculpture, all sorts of things in front of them as they walk around. Um, so in terms of, you know, what we actually achieved at uh, the Litton Tree Building, I mean, this is way back, it's two years ago now uh, that I walked in, um, came across the spaces. So we, you see on this slide here, um, up behind me, um, this is probably about three months worth of work just to strip out all of the, um, the, the problems that, you know, the, the ceilings that were about to fall in, the big holes in the roof, there were parquet, there's a huge big 20,000 parquet floor tiles on, on this floor alone, a quarter of which had been pulled up by uh, previous owners trying to work out where, where leaks were going down into the building. So I had to relay all that, um, work out how to, to actually fix these problems. But I'm kind of a, a hands-on ex-builder, that's my thing, so I really enjoy this, this, this side of things. I had people come in who were helping, shifting all the junk out of the space, um, but really, you know, we, we kind of busted it to get the space open so that we could um, chime in with the city of culture thing, so that we could have, um, I suppose it's what I call grassroots, I don't like the, the phrase fringe activity, but um, grassroots arts and culture is, is um, what, what I try and provide a home for. Next slide. So, um, I suppose my input in, in the whole thing is curation. I really, really enjoy the challenge of, of setting up a space to um, best um, show off, if you like, um, the art or the, the films or the projections, whatever we have. And I'm sort of the, the tech guy behind the scenes as well. Um, and it, I like to try and keep things easy. So um, rather than, I don't know, spending lots of money on, on um, printing things, so I, I'm always trying to look for, for easy wins to create those wow moments, those, those, those moments that 
aren't just like a regular gallery visit. They're something that you, you come in and you think, whoa, this is a bit spectacular. So I, I love projection because you can throw up a big image on a, on a screen. I love having um, mixed media, so um, visual stuff, but also audio in the room as well. Uh, and the dinner table conversations that I'm trying to, to, to get people to, to take away, if you like, you know, not just something that, oh, that was okay, but actually something that's so unusual, so, un, so remarkable that um, they'll sit down in the evening with their, their friends or family and they'll be, hey, look, I saw this thing today, it was just bonkers, and you know, they, wanna, they wanna tell the world about it. Next slide. Okay, my personal payoff. Um, what do I get from this? I mean, it, I don't know if my wife's in the audience. I hope she's not, actually, but because um, I've never told her. You know, we probably put on 150 events like this kind of thing that, um, that, that attract young audiences, older audiences, audiences from all sorts of different backgrounds. Next slide. Okay. Um, it's kind of about... It's not just an art gallery experience or a walking tour. We try and put on as many events as possible at LTB. Um, so it's, I'd, I'd say it's mostly arts and music. They're the two big, um, big, big themes, if you like, that I try and deliver. Um, but I'm looking for opportunities to give shared experience. I'm not interested in behind closed doors, um, artist studio use. Um, it's, for me, um, the opportunity is to bring the public in, to get people to come and try something new, experience something new, um, and network, you know, talk to people that, that maybe they haven't, um, you know, or wouldn't think to, to, to get involved with before. One of the things that struck me, I went up to Hull just after Country got awarded the City Culture, and um, just so that I could speak to people in the street and see, you know, how they felt about being City of Culture, what it meant to them after almost a year of of them being city culture. And one conversation struck me particularly. There was a, an old couple who said, well, oh, you know, we, we really enjoyed it and we still really enjoyed it. Why is that? Um, well, we, we never ever been to art, an art gallery or, or a museum before, but now we go all the time. Okay, why is that? Because we know that there'll always be interesting people to talk to, which for me, that, that's kind of what, what setting up a space like this is. It's, an inf it's a very informal space albeit I spent ages with the curation just to, to, to make it something that, that's, um, that, sound, that looks considered, if you like, but it, it, the informality of it and kind of just getting the positioning right so that people don't feel that they're, um, I don't know, they're going to be judged or um, that they, they you know, need an arts degree to have an opinion about something. It's very informal and that works. Next slide. Okay. Um, this is just an example of uh, the kind of varied activity that we have. This was a comedy night um, that I put on maybe three months ago now. It was flipping freezing. This is upstairs in our top floor space. There's absolutely no insulation at all. It was about two degrees. So we had an audience of, of 40 people. And they, these are comedians who come in from all over the country that a guy that I know um, organized this night. And they were walking in through the pub downstairs and like Friday and Saturday nights in, in the pub downstairs is a bit wild west. So they were like, whoa, what is this place? Um, and then walking upstairs and they were like, what? It's like a Andy Warhol, um, I don't know, New York, Manhattan loft um, experience. It was just, I don't know, for me it was because I see it all day, day in, day out. Um, it was just, it's always really interesting to see pe what people, how they perceive the unusual mix of things that we've got going on. Um, and comedy, it's you know, essentially it's storytelling. I think it just works so well in a, in, a, in a space like that. Next slide. Okay, um, making money from a free gig. It's the, the whole, kind of what, what, because I've got the building as, as, as a freebie, and we've got pretty much zero overheads in, in the space because it's all volunteer supported. Um, and we even don't have to m pay a contribution for electricity, which is just great. The, it enables me to, to program events that you wouldn't normally. So we, we have a kind of, I don't know, it's a build it and they will come uh, mentality, but it's, it's, it's we, we get people coming in and offering their, what they do for free um, 
It's up to them if they want to ticket their event to cover their overheads or make some money for themselves, but I kind of encourage people to sort of um, keep costs to a minimum. But I mean, this is, this is a, a guy who um, does gigs every night almost. He travels the country, um, double bass comedian type of thing. And he came in, um, we got about 40 people in the room and he put a hat round and he made about 100 quid just from, you know, because it was just such a great atmosphere. But it's that, I don't know, the, the freedom that, that you have when you've got a, a meanwhile use space with, when you keep the overheads to absolute minimum just gives you so much more flexibility to, to do unusual programming um, and very quickly as well. Next slide. Okay, the art of curation. This is just something I ob obsess about. Um, I'm always looking at little ways that you can tweak the experience for people. Um, a big part of what I try and encourage is young people, particularly Cov Uni students, to come in um, and use the space for, uh, I don't know, mid-year shows, end-of-year shows. Um, it's, it's really disruptive for me because they come in and they want to change everything, um, but that's really good because it kind of like makes me think, right, okay, what, um, because I hate, I hate the space being stale. You know, I like to see things swap out um, regularly and they're kind of challenging the layout that I've got, they'll, they'll try a new idea. So I really enjoy that. But I'll, I'll kind of just, I'll try and make myself as available as possible just to give them little hints and tips on how I, I would do it, um, which is sort of mainly lighting or placement. And obviously I've got a health and safety responsibility, so I'm just sort of saying, well, that doesn't quite work there because we've got a, that's a circulation space. But, um, you know, it's, I suppose that's, that's the thing that I really enjoy, just those little tweaks that um, I'm trying to pass on some of my knowledge. Because I used, in property development, you kind of, you're always looking at how to get a good photograph of a, of a space that you've, you've put together. Um, so that's, that's part of my input. Next slide. Okay, we're almost at the end now. I've, I've got two slides here, which are, are my pointers for, um, to see if I've, I've forgotten anything that I wanted to say. Uh, and then I've got a short 90 second film, which um, we had produced for us just last week. So um, 15,000 visitors since August 21, uh, 150 events, 700 participants. It, it's been a huge, huge success. Um, people love coming to the space. Um, and we've helped lots and lots of people. I, I gift wall space to artists if I, if I think the public will enjoy what um, they're pitching to me, I'll, I'll gift them in on a three weeks wall space. And that works really well. We, we rotate stuff all the one time. There's always something new to see when you come along. Um, lots of volunteer hours. That's, I, I don't know, it's, it's one of the hardest things um, to get people to regularly commit to, to supporting us. We're open every day, 12 till four, which is quite a big ask for people to regularly come in. And, uh, Cause I always insist on at least one person in the space just for meet and greets and, um, and talking to people and making sure that you know, there are no problems in the space. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, for the city, it's, it, it's been great publicity. This is something that it, it feels like it's, it's by the people for the people. Um, and um, I'm particularly Please, whenever we get non-arts visitors wander into the building and enjoy the space, that's, that's a real win because I think we really, as, as, a, as an arts community, and I suppose I'm, I'm talking as part, part of the group rather than as a, as a kind of imposter now, but um, it's like, I, I think we all really, really need to try hard to broaden the appeal of um, the whole culture offering and, and recognise that there are people out there who just, um, you know, don't really care about uh, what, what it is that we do. Next slide. Okay. I think I've said most of that already. Placemaking public space. We, placemaking quite often is, is, is about or, or thought to be about uh, community and um, getting people to, be, to, um, to talk to each other. But it, it's quite often the public spaces are the outdoor spaces. I see our space very much as, a, as an indoor space. Um, public indoor public realm, if you like, um, where I'm trying to bring uh, people together, create that community. So just finally, future plans. Um, I, I, I don't know if any, anybody's been following what, what we've been trying to do. Basically, 
The Lytton Tree Pub um, surrendered their lease um, eight weeks ago. Uh, they uh, have to hand their keys back on Monday. Uh, we are talking to Coventry City Council about the possibility of continuing on in the space um, after the pub exit, because I would absolutely love to carry on doing this for as long as I, I can. It looks like the building, because the building was, all, I, I knew this when I took it on, the building um, is down for demolition. It's part of the city centre south redevelopment footprint. And um, that uh, demolition won't be happening now until early 24. So we've got the potential of um, an opportunity to stay in the space until the end of November. But I am currently um, trying to negotiate the, the detail of that. So watch this space. Okay, so um, just a short 90 second film now, which was produced by um, a filmmaking team who approached me. Uh, they wanted some uh, funky space to, to put a little film together. And as a freebie, thank you. They just said, hey, look, we'll do a short promotional film. So that's what you're about to watch. But thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Alan. Um, and last, but by no means least, um, is Miranda Chubitaru, um, who are, uh, is an architect at Purcell Architecture. Thank you. Um, could I have the first slide, please? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Miranda Chubitaru. I'm an architect at Purcell Architecture. Um, and my presentation today will be focusing on the work we've been doing in collaboration with Warwick District Council to reimagine the town hall here in Leamington Spa into a new creative hub. Next slide, please. The project aims to increase public accessibility of this well-loved landmark building um, as a new hub of creative activities to support Leamington's already thriving creative sector and help revitalize the, the parade. The redevelopment sits within the, the wider context of an initiative known as the Creative Quarter which aims to reinvigorate um, Leamington's old town across a variety of different sites. Um, so the map shown here on this slide shows all the, the various um, sites that are included within the, the creative quarter uh, within the red boundary line of this new precinct. Um, as you can see, hopefully from the, the map, the town hall building is located um, at the very top. Um, so it very much forms the, the gateway into this uh, new quarter. The new creative hub we're proposing will host a wide range of new activities with flexible community use spaces, public exhibition areas, um, and spaces dedicated to art in a variety of different forms, while still retaining the very important civic use of this building. Next slide, please. Before I delve into the ins and outs of the, the project, um, it's important to discuss the broader concept of placemaking from an architectural and uh, design perspective. First of all, what do we mean by place? Um, obviously, a place is a set position in space, a location that is very much governed by its physical setting. Um, but there are other components that help define um, a place that make it perhaps more memorable, more distinctive. Um, first of all, it's the activities that occur in a certain place, and perhaps most importantly, the meaning that people tend to attach to places, the personal associations we often form with, uh, with our environments. Next slide, please. From a design um, point of view, good placemaking needs to achieve several key aspects which are listed here. So um, it needs to provide a, a wide range of functions, uh, multifunctioning spaces, um, encourage a high level of activity both throughout the day and during the evening. Um, it needs to promote community ownership and social interaction, um, respect the history, pre-established heritage and character of a place and, and look to enhance it and enhance the local character. Um, where possible, look to 
activate and reuse underutilized buildings, um, promote inclusivity, diversity, target people of all demographics, and last but not least, support local businesses. Next slide, please. Another very key aspect of good placemaking is engaging positively with the, the public realm. As architects, um, the spaces in between buildings are always just as important as the buildings themselves. Um, so proposals need to promote that interaction between building uses and the public realm through active ground floors and active um, building frontages. Next slide, please. So why does all this matter? Um, it's a well-known fact that people's well-being is um, very closely linked and influenced um, by their environments. So good placemaking can have an impact on people's well-being, can improve the connection between people and place, can enable people to mix, socialize, um, and can improve the character and um, identity um, of their environments. Next slide, please. So with our work at the town hall, we're naturally trying to target all of these attributes of good placemaking. Um, the existing building is already a well-established landmark within the community. It's highly significant, grade two listed, located within the Royal Leamington Conservation Area. So naturally, any proposed intervention uh, will need to be highly sensitive um, and preserve the character and architectural integrity of the existing building. Next slide, please. For those who are perhaps not familiar with the building, I'll be summarizing some of the key uh, constraints and opportunities we're working uh, with in trying to reimagine this building. Um, obviously, we're quite fortunate. We have this well-loved landmark building that is in a very prominent location within Leamington. It's got great connectivity to other public amenities within the town center. However, as you can see from the second image on the slide, um, the current main entrance and kind of arrival experience, uh, that entrance is rather forbidding, rather intimidating. So it's not currently expressing a very um, welcoming nature to visitors, perhaps. Um, we've also got some fairly unsympathetic, modern um, and attractive um, uh, interventions that are currently um, taking away from the building's significance. To the side of the building, on the third image, we've got the um, facade along Livery Street, which is this very busy, very um, vibrant, pedestrianized street leading to a busy retail center. As you can see, there's currently no um, real active frontage along this side of the building. So we're not really maximizing that opportunity. We're not encouraging the, that increased footfall on Livery Street to cross the threshold into the building. Um, and then the alternative existing means of access into this building are equally as inaccessible and um, intimidating as the, the main entrance. Next slide, please. Internally, we've got some incredible, highly significant, um, architecturally rich um, spaces which are currently underutilized. So you can see some of the very ample existing corridor spaces and that incredible um, grand internal staircase. Again, all of these remain currently underutilized. Um, and as you can see, some of the internal finishes are, are quite tired. Next slide, please. So um, before I share some of our ideas for the, the building's redevelopment, it's also important to understand the wider building typology that the town hall sits within, um, that of civic architecture. Um, so town halls are obviously buildings that have been designed with a very specific purpose in mind. They represent the architectural embodiment of uh, power and authority within the community. Um, they do tend to be really well known and well loved by local residents, uh, but their architectural style can often come across as quite austere and quite intimidating. Next slide, please. Um, internally, the plan form of town hall buildings is um, typically governed by rigor. So again, we've got spaces designed for very specific functions. And this is the case for Leamington's town hall as well. You can see here the um, 
existing first floor plan where you've got the, the council chamber to one side with all the key spaces, committee rooms, mayors and chairman's rooms arranged along the, the front. Next slide, please. So in our case, our vision is to transform the existing town hall into a new creative hub with a wide range of activities and an active ground floor where various building users can um, in interact and mix and socialize. However, the existing building's plan form is based on a series of segregated cellular spaces which make social interaction quite challenging. Um, and as I've already noted, the building is listed highly significant so any proposed alterations to the original plan form will come with um, with several challenges and will need to be very carefully considered um, usually our approach to dealing with these kind of challenges is to first and foremost understand the building and understand its historical development and by doing this we can then gain an appreciation for what constitutes high medium and low um, significance fabric um, depending on its origin um, and come up with a sensitive approach for altering the plan form to then hopefully um, be able to progress as the diagram on the slide shows from separation to integ integration of the various building users. Um, next slide please. So on to the, the proposed development plans. Um, something to, to note, please, these plans are still in draft form. The designs are evolving as we speak. Um, another key thing to note is the fact that the project has um, secured funding through the future High Street um, Fund. However, the available budget only covers parts of the building at the moment. We've obviously looked at the building holistically, designed a, a vision that covers the, the whole of the town hall, but only certain areas can be prioritized within an initial phase of development, with um, the other areas being subject to additional funding and subsequent phases. So that's what the yellow hatch on, uh, on these plans represents. So the ground floor, as I've already established, we're trying to really activate it, open it up to the public, have it as the primary public facing area of the building. And as I've previously alluded to, we're, we're looking to form a new point of access into the building from Livery Street, just to improve that connection to the public realm and the busy street scene um, to the north of the building. Internally, we're, we're looking to create a new anchor space in close proximity to the building's main entrance. Um, so a space for visitors to be able to congregate, uh, pause, reflect, um, interact. Um, we're also looking to form a new shop as part of the proposals in this new phase, uh, first phase, sorry. Um, and then also look at um, making some of the circulation areas within the building, including that uh, grand staircase, work a little bit harder by incorporating some elements of um, public exhibition within them. Last but not least, very important are the visitor support facilities. So making sure toilet facilities are um, adequate, fully accessible, and also improving the vertical circulation through the building through the provision of a new lift located at the, the rear of the building. Um, in the next phases, we're also looking to create some new maker spaces, um, as well as a flexible multi-use space for community use, um, but also a new cafe along Livery Street, which will then form this natural gateway into the building from, uh, from the north side. Um, to the other side of the plan, we're also looking to incorporate some more flexible office space as well. Next slide, please. Moving on to the first floor, um, you can note uh, immediately by looking at the plan that we've got two key spaces to either side of the building. We've got the existing assembly hall and the council chamber. Um, for the time being, um, the primary existing use of this space, these spaces is um, to be retained. Uh, but back within the, um, the yellow hatch, um, we are again looking at improving those key visitor support facilities, um, improving access to this um, 
first floor level. There is currently an existing lift within the building, but it's really small and not entirely compliant with current accessibility regulations. Um, so providing that new passenger lift at the back of the building will be key for improving that accessibility. Um, again, on this level as well, we've got all the corridor spaces and that um, internal staircase, which will be maximized in terms of their use as public exhibition areas, as well as a new breakout space, which can double as an exhibition space, which forms the route through to that rear lift. Um, and finally, a new flexible multi-use space, um, which can be hireable for conferences, workshops, and all sorts of other activities that has access out onto a balcony with views out on the parade. Next slide, please. Finally, in terms of the building second floor, the intention is for this level to remain the more private area of the building. So we're looking at um, flexible office spaces. The current use up there is office space, so it's retaining the, the same theme and improving staff welfare facilities up there as well. Next slide, please. So as I've mentioned before, one of the key interventions we're proposing is forming this new point of access um, on the building's north elevation on Livery Street. Um, this is going to bring great benefits, first of all, improving that connection with the public realm, improving the overall permeability of that ground floor internally, and accessibility of the building. This is the only area around the building where level access can be very easily um, achieved. Um, and also, this will activate what otherwise would become a dead-end corridor space to the other side internally, so maximizing the, the use of all available space inside the building. Obviously, this intervention will come with some associated loss of original building fabric, um, but we hope that the heritage impact is outweighed by the, the public benefits, um, and we think that the proposed entrance is quite sympathetic um, to the, the character and architectural language of the existing facade, um, taking very obvious references from um, existing detailing of those first floor windows above. Um, this design response was arrived at through positive engagement with the local conservation advisory forum as well. Next slide, please. We're also looking to look a bit more closely at the um, accessibility of the main entrance. Uh, as you can see, we have a fairly uh, detracting set of uh, modern timber steps and ramps to provide that level access. Um, however, we're hoping to, to be able to provide a more permanent solution um, there that hopefully provides a better aesthetic value as well and an improved visitor arrival um, experience. Next slide, please. Um, at the back of the building, we're looking to completely reconfigure what is there. There's a, a small existing photos at the top of the, the slide that shows that, again, we're dealing with quite a few modern and attractive additions that have accumulated um, at the back of the building throughout time. Um, so because we're looking to provide a new lift in this um, location, we're taking that as an opportunity to completely reorder this um, area of the building and re-provide those key uh, visitor support facilities, um, but through a more cohesive piece of design, something that is more sympathetic to the existing building and um, that directly responds to the pre-established architectural language. Next slide, please. Finally, internally, we're aiming to overall improve and increase the public outreach, so the, the offering for members of the community. Um, public exhibition spaces will be incorporated within the underutilized circulation areas, and the new anchor space will be provided on this level to allow visitors to come together and, and interact. Um, we hope that this will provide um, opportunities to showcase local creativity. Um, and of course, as with all the other interventions, uh, this will involve some degree of alteration to the, the plan form. Um, but all of these proposals have um, come from a, a deep understanding of the history of the building. So we think that um, some of the heritage impact um, is mitigated by the, the very clear public benefit um, that we're looking to, to achieve. Next slide, please. 
So in the next period, we're going to be um, very busy gaining the relevant statutory uh, consent, um, designing, uh, but refining the design even further and uh, procuring a contractor to then hopefully make a start on site in September this year. The project is very high paced. The, the funding that we've got available needs to be spent by March 2024 which means that hopefully we'll be uh, in a position to welcome you all to, to see the outcome of this um, initial phase of the, the project um, in uh, late spring 2024. Um, and something to note, obviously there was only so much I could cover um, in a 15 minute presentation, but for those that do want to learn more about the detail, detail of this project, we are holding a public exhibition at the Town Hall on the 2nd of March from 11am to 1pm. Thank you.